Welcome to Unfuck Your Brain, the only podcast that teaches you how to use psychology, feminism, and coaching to rewire your brain and get what you want in life. And now here's your host, Harvard Law School grad, feminist rock star, and master coach, Kara Lowenthal. Hello, my friends. So I am so excited for you to hear the conversation that we're going to have on this episode and the next episode. It's about a topic that I have kind of historically had a lot of different thoughts and feelings about and to some extent had avoided talking about because I was actually replicating some of the problems (laughs) by thinking in this very all or nothing way about it, just like the black and white thinking episode I just did. And sort of thinking that everything has to be like being on one side or the other or agreeing 100% or disagreeing 100%. And then once I realized that actually it was okay to just have a truthful, honest, nuanced, sophisticated conversation, it all opened up for me. And so and I have some of my students coming on and these conversations are so important and I think you're going to get so much out of them. Before we get to that, I want to say that I think a lot of what you will hear in these conversations is the ways in which some of our thoughts and feelings around what term to even use, because all the terms are so loaded and are like one side or the other, quote unquote, but any of our feelings about being reproached (laughs) or called in or called out or canceled, right, or whatever term we want to use, being called to account, being offered critique, being invited into a better process and conversation, like whatever we call We talk about how some of that stuff is actually just all mixed up in all of our own fears about what other people think. And so I wanted to remind you all that whatever your thoughts about yourself are, they don't have to necessarily stay that way. And that I have a free resource called the Confidence Cheat Sheet that you can download and use to help you build up your self-confidence. Because whatever your thoughts are about these issues that we tackle on this podcast, what is definitely true is that when you have negative thoughts about yourself, you can't really hear anything anyone offers you clearly, positive or negative. So if you want to get that confidence cheat sheet and use those kind of concrete practices I teach in it, you can text your email address to plus one three four seven nine nine seven one seven eight four. Again, text your email to plus one three four seven nine nine seven one seven eight four and use the code word confidence when you're asked for the code word, or you can just go to unfuckyourbrain.com forward slash confidence. All right, I'll let past me (laughs) take it away. Hello, my chickens. I am so excited. seems like a weird word for talking about this topic we're going to talk about, but I am really excited to have this conversation because I think that it is a conversation that really needs to be had. And like so many conversations that happen in the social media community or even in the self-development or the social justice community, there's so much black and white thinking. And so those of you who've listened to the black and white thinking episode that I just did on the podcast, I really wrote that podcast episode as I was starting to think about having these conversations and where the kind of black and white thinking shows up in self-development, in social justice, in online interactions, and how all of that kind of coalesces in our interactions and our thoughts about them. So I invited three of my incredible students from my advanced certification in feminist coaching to come talk to me about this. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. They bring a real variety of perspectives. But one of the things that I wanted to kind of acknowledge up front is that as a white woman talking about these things, the whole idea of call-ins or call-outs or accountability culture or cancel culture, we're going to even talk about what the name is, right, is a social movement that comes out of Black communities and particularly Black feminist American communities And that is also connected to practices of restorative justice that come out of different philosophical traditions, but especially South Africa after apartheid. So the context of this, like we need to be conscious of where we are and what communities we are in, in the context when we talk about it. And that's why I wanted to make sure that I had multiple people's perspectives in this conversation, aside from the fact that my students are just brilliant and each have had a lot of thoughts about this phenomenon that they're going to share with you. So I'm just going to let them choose themselves, but I'm just going to like say who should introduce themselves for this so that it's not chaos. So Amber, why don't you just introduce yourself first? Tell us, you know, who you are, who you coach, anything else you think we should know. 
Yeah, awesome. My name is Amber Taylor, and I dub myself as the Black Experience Coach. I coach Black women to be comfortable being their most authentic versions of themselves and then kick ass as that version of themselves. And I do that by identifying how they can center their own pleasure and gain confidence and authenticity in that way. I just wanted to shout out, I'm also a clutch coach. So also hey, check in. Coach. <laughs> <laughs> Behind the scenes coming out. <laughs> cool. I'm Brig Johnson and I coach high achieving black women and I help them show up in their most authentic self. Amazing. Brenda. Mm-hmm. Hi everyone. My name's Brenda. I'm happy to be a part of this conversation and share, you know, whatever experiences that I've had and, I'm a master coach. I've been friends and colleagues with Cara for a long time. And the work that I do with my clients that I'm very, very passionate about is really helping my clients be done struggling with weight and food, which is something that so many women spend so much of their life struggling with. And that was my experience. So that's the work that I do. I also this year in 2021, with my colleague Judith, Chu, oh my gosh, why am I messing up her name? <laughs> Judith Gaton, we also started the Latinx Coaches Directory, which is something else that I've been up to, and I'm happy to be here and be a part of the conversation. Brenda is already famous on the podcast because first we did a podcast episode. And then when I did the Black and White Thinking podcast, I started off with talking about one of my students' reactions to Brenda being on her podcast episodes. I don't think you've even heard that yet, but oh, somebody- no, I haven't. <laughs> well, it was just something we've talked about before, right? It's like the combination of feminism and weight loss coaching. So I on the Black and White podcast, I talked about how one of my students was like, wait, my brain is breaking. Like, what's happening? You're having a weight loss coach on your podcast. Like, why is like, Brenda here? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we're going to coach you on that later. I don't think it's about you. It was just about... But it's obviously surprising if you listen to my podcast for me to be like, now here's my guest, a weight loss coach. Like, obviously not in keeping with my normal branding. But that's... Yeah. Anyway, I talk all about that in the Black and White podcast. But just to say, those people listening to the podcast will already know who you are well. They've heard from you once and then heard about the follow-up. Well, and I'll just say one more thing. I think that there's complexities in all of this, yeah. right? Like, I'll say that much. There's complexities. I feel like that's the theme of this whole conversation. Yeah. So the first thing, and I messaged everybody before that I wanted to talk about what we even call it, because we're going to need to like use a noun when we're talking about it. But it feels to me like, you know, I coming from reproductive rights work and abortion rights work, it was kind of similar where it's like, there was like no neutral term, right? It's like you're pro-life or you're mm-hmm. pro-choice. And there was no like, kind of, is there a third word we can use to describe the things we're talking about that doesn't immediately position us as having like a particular staked out position, right? So people who oppose whatever it is we're talking about, which we have to define, would call it cancel culture. And people who support it would call it accountability processes, maybe call in culture. Maybe there are other terms for it, but like, I'm like, what are we going to call it? What words can we use? And we have to even define what we're talking about that aren't already like now I've staked a position and I'm on these people's side or these people's side about this thing, right? It's that exact complexity. So I'm curious like what you guys think. I think the thing that I'm talking about is sort of, and let's see if we even mean the same thing, is the practice of publicly identifying people and identifying whatever actions that someone thinks they have taken that are considered to be problematic and then having a sort of semi-disorganized, semi-organized public conversation or campaign around that, which may involve requests for accountability of some kind, which may involve requests for apology, may involve requests for specific actions that some people want other people to take, may involve people activating their social networks to weigh in and get involved. I'm trying to describe this in like very neutral terms, like just to make sure we sort of are all talking about the same thing. Like that's like the circumstance is that these things occur, right? But like, what are we even going to call that? I'm curious if you guys have any ideas. Well, I went to the internet and right, nice. <laughs> um, I found a professor, Lisa Nakamura mm-hmm. at University of Michigan. She defines it as a cultural boycott mm-hmm. of a certain celebrity brand or cultural concept. And Marion Webster says cancel culture is a demand for greater accountability from public figures. Yeah, that's interesting. A boycott or a, it feels like it's both because it's not just like don't buy this person's whatever, Mm -hmm. right? It's sort of like there's this like 
public conversational and performance aspect to it. I just think about like the Park Slope co-op famously had a big debate about boycotting Israeli products, but it wasn't sort of like, okay, the CEO of Sabra Hummus needs to make a certain kind of Instagram post, right? It's sort of like boycott is sort of like, are we going to purchase these things? But I like that. That does feel a little more neutral. I think it does feel challenging to give it like a label, I guess, if we were going to give it a label that can acknowledge, I guess, if we were to call it like both parts or the yeah. different you know, roles that it could serve. I like online accountability discourse. Is that yeah. kind of like? I kind of like the word accountability in there because I think the intent is in some form or another, maybe the delivery or, but the intent is some form of accountability or yeah. change, right? Yeah. Which is such an interesting concept from a thought work perspective, right? Right. Like, and I think that's something we need to talk about. Okay. So how do we feel about calling it online accountability discourse? Discourse. <laughs> <laughs> and processes or processes, one of those kind of. Right. Yeah. I and I think like I need we, to look up the right. definition of discourse. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think because there's sort of both. It's like sometimes there's specific campaigns happening and sometimes it's more just like a conversation about whether these things should even exist or who gets to decide, mm -hmm. whatever. Right. And I do think we should specify accountability is a word usually used by people who support this kind of process. And it sounds positive. And I think we're really using it to mean like, that's the claim being made. Like, is that accountability is involved? It's not us saying like, and that's always correct or always incorrect. It's just, that's like the thing that the person doing it is trying to do, right? Is to create some kind of accountability that they think should happen. Right. Okay. For anyone listening who maybe also <laughs> doesn't know what discourse means, I looked it up, written or spoken communication or debate. So there it's like, go. thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's like I get that word now because it's just descriptive in a kind of objective Way. Yeah. Sorry. I'm an asshole. I'm an academic. I'm from this from the academia. <laughs> no, you're, you're not like, like discourse actually... is like the word potato. <laughs> like everybody's just like <laughs> No, I love one of the things benefits for me of just being your friend car and being around you. Like I just learned so many new words. And I've, initially I just used to be like embarrassed and I just would keep it to myself, look it up later. And I'm like, oh cool. Like I'll just look up that oh, word. No. I also I just word. use weird words that like nobody has used since the 18th century because when I was a child we didn't have a TV and my father just had us reading like 19th century literature. So I totally am just using words. I mean discourse is used now, but I will say things and people are like, I, nobody has said that since like 1845. That's not a <laughs> word that people use anymore. Also it doesn't matter how educated you are until I was 35 I thought the word misshapen was pronounced mishapen. It just, and then somebody said it out loud and I was like, you know, that makes a lot more sense actually <laughs> given yeah, the definition of the word that sort of <laughs> checks out. Yeah. But I just was like walking around saying Miss Hapen and nobody was correcting me <laughs> anyway. All right. So I had this like whole list of questions. I don't know if we'll get to any of them, but actually I kind of just want to ask when we do this life coach way, not academic way, which is like, why were each of you interested in talking about this with me? Like, I'm curious kind of you know, this didn't come out of a vacuum. We were having conversations in Slack and you all were weighing in on them. And then I was like, oh, let's do a podcast on this in our advanced certification Slack. So I'd be curious just to hear from you all, like, why did you want to come discuss this? <laughs> Even if like Brenda, you were like, maybe I hate this idea. It was terrible. It came, <laughs> came around. <laughs> well, I guess I'll start. Well, it came up in our coaching actually. So you and I, Cara, were in a mastermind where you and I and a couple of other of our life coach colleagues, we've been supporting each other in our business goals for years, specifically like growth and revenue goals. And in the past couple months, like for me, there's been like this fear, just like, right. Every time that we have met for our mastermind, there's been like this fear and it feels like almost like a primitive fear. Like I would feel it in my body. And really in my head, it was like the fear of being canceled. Like, oh my gosh, you know, Instagram is like, that's the place where you get canceled, <laughs> you know, <laughs> or like if I was going to be on like this podcast with a bigger audience in my mind, my brain was freaking out like that is dangerous, you know, like abort mission. You know what? Maybe we just don't have the seven figure goal. Maybe we just <laughs> stay here. It's fine. Like you're making multiple six figures. That's a dream. And so, you know, that's what had been coming up for me. I think we'll talk about this a little bit more about how use of the model comes into play here. But I, I think a big part for me of why I was able to navigate through that and probably will continue to is like I can really shift into compassion for my brain. Because for me, 
one of the questions you have on the list is like, how much of this is really about cancel culture and how much of is it just our own fear of social rejection, people's opinions. And I mean, definitely for me, I could probably just say that that's what it was, but I could have so much compassion for my brain because I can also say like, you know what, that really makes sense. Like I remember, you know, when I was way younger and I had a really heavy accent because Spanish was my first language. Like, I remember the racial slurs and even being beat up, you know, for that being something different. And like the things like go back to Mexico, like that kind of thing. So I can have so much compassion for my brain for like why it actually makes sense that Mm -hmm. my brain thinks it's scary for me to be seen, for me to be heard. And anyways, the reason for me, like why, even though, you know, my brain's like, why are we going to do this again? Like, you know, be on the podcast is because I'm pretty certain that I'm not the only one. And if I share something that I have learned from navigating the fear of being canceled, then I will do that. I will share. So I think that brings up two really important things. It is definitely something I want to touch on because I do think part of what goes on in the like online accountability discourse is that so many things get mixed up in it that are really separate issues. Right. And like one of them is For those of us who already are people pleasers or socialized to fear other people's opinions or fear rejection, now we're just taking all of those feelings, assigning them to quote unquote cancel culture, and then saying that cancel culture causes them, right? Right. As though if this online accountability process or discourse didn't exist, we wouldn't worry what people thought of us, right? As if like without Instagram, we wouldn't be worried about putting ourselves out there. And that's obviously just not true, right? We were- worried about that before Instagram. (laughs) So that doesn't mean that there aren't things to critique about some of the ways the processes go on. But I do think there's this conflation happening of like, well, I'm scared of what other people think. So that must be because cancel culture is real and bad as opposed to like, well, I'm definitely just scared of what other people think. And that may or may not have anything to do with online accountability processes or calls for that, right? Like they're just separate things. Which was the case for me. I mean, this is super fun too. Like, It's been so worth it to navigate that, number one, because I mean, I feel like I'm in a place where I have my own back harder than ever, right? Like, yeah, people can have opinions and I will be probably will be judged the more and more that I put my message out there. Example, she's a weight loss coach, so there's no way she's a feminist. Just a small example, like <laughs> just not personal, just like a hypothetical example. Like, that totally just... hypothetical. <laughs> no, but that was one of my biggest, like, I'm gonna be canceled by like anti-weight loss people mm-hmm. or whatever. You know, just an example. <laughs> Again, not not <laughs> hypothetical, maybe hypothetical. But through navigating that, like I can also say, and like it was definitely barfy. And again, it's definitely going to be probably a process. In this past month, I've like doubled my revenue. I was about to tell you to tell everybody that, yes. right? Like- yeah, oh my gosh. <laughs> it's so fun. I've like. She so- means literally double. She's had a month that is double what her previous highest month was. Yes. It's like blowing my mind. And I know that this is just the beginning. And it's because, again, I mean, like, yeah, of course, that's really fun. It's really fun to like, have that breakthrough. But number one, the most priceless thing for me is like, how like solid I have my back, because I did that work of like, oh, yeah, people could like, quote, unquote, cancel, you have opinions and like me actually being okay with that. So Right, which is what allows you to show up as more and more of yourself, which is what grows your business, right? Because, like, it's you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is what I would observe my brain doing so much is assuming that everyone will hate me and cancel me. And then turns out, actually, if you're just yourself, people (laughs) might actually just like you. (laughs) Right. We're not, we're like, our brains are like, that's definitely not an option. It's Yeah. I'm curious what, there was something else you said that I want to come back to, but now I've also forgotten it and I want to hear what Amber and Brig think about this. We'll come back to it. But I'm curious both either if something from what Brenda said you wanted to weigh in on, or if you just want to share kind of why you were interested in talking about this. Yeah, I'll go. Mine's was similar to Brenda. I think that was our Slack thing was I was saying how for me, it was very personal too, about not wanting to show up as the coach for high achieving black woman, because I thought I needed like all this education and, you know, 
African-American history studies and all of this in order to say I coach high achieving black women. And so just that fear, as Brenda was saying, of like saying the wrong thing and like, oh, she didn't read that book or just all of the stuff. So it was that fear of just not being accepted or being canceled. But for me, it was more fueled by when I started doing a thought, thank God I'm a life coach, right? (laughs) Sometimes it helps, right? (laughs) Like all the time, ever yeah, really. But (laughs) you know, it's like when I really sat with it, I was like, oh, because there's this thought that like if I'm not accepted by other cultures, my own culture, like to be, you know, canceled by my own culture is like the Mm -hmm. kiss of death. And so that fear was like, oh, and I was like, oh, that's the thought that's creating it, which is like that intense visceral fear that Brenda was saying. It's like to be canceled by people who look like you. And that's your safe haven because, Mm -hmm. you know, you have thoughts like when I go out, I don't belong. If I can't belong in my own community, then where is I? Like if I get kicked off the island, there's not another island to go to. It's like this is our island. But, you know, I look at other cultures like, oh, you get kicked off the island. There's other islands for you to go to. I was like, my mind is really making this really dramatic thing (laughs) as if I didn't create the island in the first place. And then I realized. I create my belonging wherever I go. So in whichever culture I'm in, I create my belonging. So for me, it was more about sharing that experience of how when we create our own belonging, like that cancel culture thing, that fear is less. At least I've experienced it a whole lot less because I say some stuff and I know people have lots of thoughts about some of the shit I say. (laughs) do, right? Like if you're saying stuff that nobody has any thoughts about, what are you saying? Happy Mother's Day? Like people even have thoughts about that. Like, right. Yeah. You know, you shouldn't wish people happy Mother's Day. Some people don't have mothers. Like there's nothing you could say that nobody will have thoughts about. But I think your point about that in group is so true because for me, like I was never afraid of judgment from yeah, if like the men's rights activists want to come out and like yell at me, who gives a shit, right? Right. But it was like other feminists, right? Well, but I can't like what are all the other feminists going to think? Like, that's who I'm afraid of judging me. You know, that's who I'm afraid of whatever. And I do think like for me, definitely sense of belonging, but also, you know, it's like weird, like as a social justice activist, obviously I was like pretty familiar with the idea that social justice movements are diverse and complicated. And then I came into life coaching and I just, I don't know, like all my past knowledge fell out of my brain. And I was sort of like back in this, like, well, there's a right way and a wrong way. And like, you know, somebody is going to disagree with me and then there's going to be an online process of some kind, whatever. And I think like the piece for me has been similar to what I think both of you were saying, but the, that sort of complexity that we talk about in the advanced certification all the time, right? The whole idea is like, okay, your original life coaching training is a little bit black and white. And like, now how can we develop the complexity and like the truth that there's no right way to be a feminist? So for sure, some people are going to be upset with what I say. And we are both have very deeply held convictions about what this word means and what the movement is and how it should work. And like, there's always going to be that disagreement. So, but I think that point about like who we are worried about quote unquote, canceling us or not liking us or whatever is that like in group, none of us are upset. I don't think if Fox news was going to like, yeah, if Fox news went after me, I'd be like, awesome free publicity. Thank you. Like, (laughs) Right. Not concerned, yeah. right. Yeah. Other than that, you got, other than that, maybe there's a lot of more gun owners than in my population, but like, right. Not concerned. Cause they're not my in group. But if like Ms. Magazine did a profile on like the toxicity of Cara Lowenthal's feminism or something, like I would have a right. lot more self-coaching to do. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, totally. Totally. What about you, Amber? Yeah, I'm definitely in line in what Brenda and Brig both said. And like, as they were talking, what came to me was like, the fear of being marginalized more because it's not necessarily getting canceled. Like Briggs said, like there's another island that you can go to, but like to be a marginalized person and then to like lose the in group is a whole nother fear. And for me personally, like coming out as a coach for Black women, create space for Black women and saying I'm a Black experience coach. Like I was scared of the whole flashback of like, Black isn't a monolith. Everybody isn't the same. How can you like say that? And it's just like, 
that's not what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> not the black monolith experience coach. <laughs> no, right. I'm just like trying to create space for people that traditionally don't have spaces created for them. And with that, you could bring a ton of stuff that I have no idea about, but because I'm a life coach, I'll be able to help you through it and coach you on it. And I definitely had to do a lot of self-coaching and understanding like where my fear was. And I think some of it was a fear of rejection, but another part of it like that I think just comes with the cancel culture is that when actual celebrities or public figures are canceled, like they lose resources, they lose opportunities, they lose money, and just kind of like that swift and public stripping of like everything was like a big fear. But I think it's important to talk about the difference between, you know, regular people. And mm-hmm. I know we're all awesome people, but like, we don't have any, <laughs> like, as we're many not like eyes. George Clooney level. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, we don't have that many eyes on us. And like, one of the big are we allowed to say like real people's names on here? Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think so. Don't say my bullet. I, I have no legal responsibility for anything anybody else is about to say. Go. For that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, like one of the things that comes to mind for cancel culture is like R. Kelly and how for him, like it had to be a movement that people were like, stop playing his music, stop celebrating this man, like stop giving him money because he is using it to abuse underage women and over (laughs) of age yeah of age yeah so it's like to remove his resources so he can stop being a predator like that is cancel culture and that's where I think like I don't know the good part of it Mm -hmm. was it like trying to hold people accountable like trying to use the masses use social media use people's knowledge to remove somebody from power but then like I think now people use it as a word to kind of escape accountability in a lot of times like oh i'm being canceled it's like no you're being called out or called in or whatever like what you did was wrong and you should know that Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i think there's a difference like and i'm not afraid of being like told i've done something wrong like i fuck up all the time like tell me so i can fix it or even we can have a conversation about it. Maybe I stand my ground or like, you know, whatever. But I think that's different than like a full cancellation of like the resource removal. Yeah. Well, I feel like that's such an important point, right? And one of the things I want us to talk about, which is like, what's the origin of this practice is what you could think of as like, I can't remember where I saw this. I don't want to steal an idea without crediting, but also I don't know if it's actually one person's idea, but like vertical, right? It's like people without power, trying to call somebody with a lot of power and resources to account, right, for behavior. So it's not like Brenda, like if Brenda has a problem with me, that's more of a like interpersonal accountability issue, right? As opposed to like the whole genesis of the practice was supposed to be from communities who feel like they don't have a voice and don't have a way to get accountability and people are getting away with, you know, harming them over and over and over to have some kind of sort of extra legal like mechanism to try to create that kind of justice. But then like something's gone haywire either in our brains or in the culture when what that turns into is like Brenda thinking that she can't talk about her own ethnic and racial background because she will get like canceled for being too Latina. Are you guys feeling like you're going to get canceled for being not black in the right ways? Or I'm just interested in what you guys think about that because it does feel to me like we've taken something that made sense in one context. Like, One option would be, yes, it's actually being used in this different way that isn't as productive. One option is like, well, no, it's mostly just our thoughts, right? That's that whole, like, we're just taking all of our fear and attaching it to that. So I don't know. I'm just curious what you think. I mean, because I don't participate in a lot of online social justice spaces, I feel like I'm only aware of, like, the big, more public ones, like Rachel Hollis, like, very high-profile person. People are trying to call her to account in this particular way. But then I also know there are other communities where there's a lot of what I would call like more horizontal stuff where like people are sort of calling in or calling out or asking for accountability processes from other people in their community who don't have big followings and it's more of an intra-community thing. Anyway, I don't know. That was really not a well-formed question. But I'm just curious, what, what if any thoughts you guys have about kind of the differences between like a group of people trying to get accountability from a very public resourced figure who's causing material harm, right, versus sort of maybe the more horizontal, like someone who's not that big or doesn't have a big following or like, you know, because they don't like 
the language they're using or they've heard about something they did in their interpersonal life, like that's something that happened in a romantic relationship that a third person thinks is abusive or like, I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts about like if there are differences between the ways these processes are operating kind of. Yeah, I was going to say when it's more horizontal, I think what I see is the thing of like, it's different thoughts. And sometimes we just have different thoughts, Mm -hmm. same intention, different thoughts. So therefore it's going to look differently, but the call out then feels so primal and the fear of the call out because you have different thoughts or a different approach to something is like you're saying in the social justice movement and any other movement, we all will have different thoughts about it. And then as a culture, what we're saying is we're all supposed to think the same then all we do is keep creating the same culture. So there is a place for us to think differently and (laughs) to have different thoughts and to not go with the flow of things. And so within the horizontal thing, I may not agree with how you do it, but does that demand a call out like or cancel? You know, I think that's where it is. It's that that fear of I can't even say a different thought that may go against you because then you will use your resources to counsel me. I think that's where it is. Like we get to own who we are and we get to own and understand that we create our own resources. Like that's where you add the life coaching back into it. And like, right. Right. right and accepting is like, no, I create my own value. I create my own belonging, but you have to do that work in order to do that. Yeah. I think that's why it's so complex and why I hate right. the discourse around it being so simplified. Right. Is like on the one hand, It wouldn't make any sense for us as coaches to be like, okay, when you try to tell your partner how they have to take out the trash, you're trying to control them, it's not going to work. But when you want to tell a stranger on the internet what they have to think, that totally will work and you should go do it, (laughs) right? Right. Like there's some level of that, like you can't control other people, but they're also not all the same, right? R. Kelly is like up here and then maybe Rachel Hollis is in the middle and then there's like people like... I mean, like it brings up for me so many philosophical questions of like, what is harm? What is violence? What are we describing as harm and violence? Like who gets to decide that? We may have different opinions of it, right? I think about this with myself. Like, I think this is such an interesting thought experiment for all of us to do. If I think a man, and I'm picking an example where I'm the like, you know, marginalized community. If I think a straight cis man, something he said or done is sexist and he disagrees, am I always a hundred percent right because I'm a woman? Right. Like some of that is the logic inherent in some of these conversations, I think. And I don't know. It's like objectively, I want to say no. Subjectively, in any given example, I'm like, well, who knows better, me or you, if you're being sexist, probably me. Right. So, like, I understand that impulse. But I do think these are the questions that, like, if we want to grapple with the stuff, honestly, we have to grapple with. Like, I have an opinion about how somebody else is thinking, talking, or acting. Right. And of what course, as life this? coaches, we know that's what you're going to see, right? Like right, right. That, that's what you're going to see and that's what you're going to find evidence right. for. It's like, and what's the source of my authority on that, right? Like right. who gets to decide that? Should it be me? And what is that based on? Is it based on my identity? Is it based on my experience? Is it based on my education? Is it based on my logic, right? Like I feel like these are the deeper questions that we have to grapple with because none of us on this call want to be like, So there should be no such thing as any accountability for whatever anybody does. Like, that's obviously not where we are. And yet it also can't be quite right that anytime anybody has a thought that somebody else needs to be accountable to them because they have a disagreement, that also can't be right either, right? So it's like, this has to be a more complicated conversation in the middle. That's what I feel like we're not having. Did you want to say something, Brenda? I think you were trying to get in before. Yeah, just to add to what you are already saying there. So for me as a woman of color, and because we're talking about accountability culture slash cancel culture, I mean, like from where I'm sitting, I could see it both ways. I could see it in multiple ways. I could see how it's so not useful for me as a woman of color and like all the fears that I'm having. And like I could just see how that's not useful at all. And honestly, I'm just thankful that I have tools to navigate through it. And so, you know, with the coaching, we are so big on like that individual empowerment and liberation by being able to have awareness of your own mind. So I think like for me, I'm kind of seeing that this is probably I feel where it's going to come down to each person being aware, like in that individual situation that you may be in, like, is this my own fears and fears of people's opinions, et cetera. But On that same note, like at the same time, again, myself as a woman of color, and if you identify with any like marginalized community, I could also see the benefit of having 
something like that as a tool in the way you were mm-hmm. describing it, because it is true that there are power dynamics in, you know, various communities. Like I've observed that. Of course, you know, it's all our own thoughts, but also like, I mean, I think everyone on this call agrees that there are power dynamics <laughs> and like, <laughs> right, of course, and that there's also harm that happens that there aren't any kind of institutional or structural channels to deal with or that don't work, right? So whether it's like R. Kelly or, I mean, I think about like Harvey Weinstein wasn't so much canceled as arrested, but like, you know, like there's people sort of committing harms over and over that a community knows about that there's no way to do anything about or people who are, you know, stealing intellectual property or labor from different communities, like white women stealing intellectual property labor from black women. And like, well, are you going to take them to copyright court? Like there isn't necessarily any kind of formal infrastructure for it, right? So there is this very like, I think, populist social movement element to like, okay, we have to come up with our own forms of accountability and our own forms of like trying to mobilize against oppressive power, right? So it's like, obviously, I think all of us agree that there's value in that and it's important in some ways. And then it's just like, but is that what's happening? Is there a way to separate different things that are happening? It's just so fascinating. That's just become such a like bogeyman for so many people, right? And like, the other thing I want us to talk about as coaches is like, what's the psychological part behind all this, right? Like, I think there's like, you can't understand the phenomenon without understanding why it feels good for people to participate Mm -hmm. in a public accountability process, right? Like not the leaders, but like all the people who then join in, right? Why does that feel so good to us? I think is like, you have to understand you're getting a hit of dopamine from- right. Totally. participating and what's going on there. So I'm curious if you guys have thoughts about that. Yeah, I think for me, part of that disagreement and where people get, I don't know, their kicks from it is <laughs> you did something that I didn't like and I need to call you out. I need to like hold you accountable or whatever so that I can feel better. Mm-hmm. And like as coaches, we know that that isn't the case. We don't need anybody else to do or say anything to make us feel better. But for the masses, it's I don't know if I want to say self-love, but like it's a way to, I don't even know if I want to say this either, but have your own back to call somebody out because in that moment, it makes you feel better Mm -hmm. about what you have going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes you feel powerful. I think, right. Like that you are taking this action that you're participating. And I think I can speak to like from the white woman perspective, I think there's so much internalized and undealt with like shame and guilt around white supremacy and complicity in white supremacy that people do not deal with in productive ways. And then this becomes a way to like feel better about that. Right. It's like all of that gets channeled into this process. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like a form of like a virtue signaling is a dismissive term, but I really don't mean it that way as a coach. I understand what's happening. People are just like terrified and rejecting themselves all the time and shaming themselves and then projecting that onto other people. And then trying to like I mean, the truth is when you're quote unquote virtue signaling, you're just signaling to yourself. You're the person you're trying to reassure that you're an okay person. It's all just you, right? Mm -hmm. But I think there's that, like, we can't understand this without understanding that like humans are pack animals and there's like a hit of dopamine that comes from participating in a big group event where like, it's like a concert, (laughs) like, except that there's very different consequences. But like, I mean, there's a reason that in human history, I hesitate to talk about this because I am not saying that an online accountability process is the same as a mob. And I think people who are against any of this use the phrase mob mentality. And that's like a reductive phrase. But it's also blind to pretend that there isn't a like, physiological, psychological thing that happens to people when they all get to band together and act against a quote unquote common enemy. That's how humans have evolved. And that feels good to us. And I feel like we can't understand what's going on without that. And I do think maybe as I'm talking about it, it's like our society feels now so fragmented, right? And like online is this weird space where people like we don't have those physical communities anymore in the same ways, especially the last year or two. And like on now those communities are like, coalescing and forming online, like around these processes, as opposed to whatever they would be about in real life. Yeah. I think the other part of it is, and you mentioned it with the uh, dopamine hit is for the individual that is afraid of being canceled. Like, you know, people like me, Brenda, Amber, like we talked about is to remember that that cynic part of the dopamine hit, like, see, I told you so hit, see safe, like don't do it Mm -hmm. when we see it. And your brain is like, see, I told you that happened. There is that part of like, see, a dopamine hit even with that. 
Like <laughs> I told you that was not safe. And there you see it and you see an example of it, like with the Rachel Hollis thing, and you get a little hit of dopamine also with that. To be aware of the dopamine hits is important of where it's coming from and like, oh, okay, that's just my body doing a physiologic thing also. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think right. we take it to mean I'm doing something righteous. That's why this feels good. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And like, it feels good because it's caused by your thoughts. You could totally decide to believe you're doing something righteous on purpose, but right. We would always tell a client, like, just because you got a hit of dopamine, that doesn't mean anything about like the moral content of the thing you're doing. Like you got a hit of dopamine from, I don't know, smoking a pack of cigarettes. Like it doesn't necessarily mean it's good for you. It doesn't necessarily mean it's moral in any way, positive or negative. It's just a neutral thing. So I do think like to understand more about like what's happening in my body when I see this happening, when I'm afraid of it, when I want to participate in it, when I, whatever, right. And what's going on. And that doesn't mean it's bad. It's just something we should be aware of. So we're making a more informed decision, I think. That was such a rich and juicy conversation and we're not done yet. This podcast episode, when we recorded it was so fascinating and rich and important and long. (laughs) And so we've cut it in half. This was the first half and you will be hearing the second half, the follow-up to this conversation next week. So if listening to this, you feel like you have questions, there are things we haven't discussed or resolved yet, totally right. (laughs) There's more to discuss and we will be discussing all of it next week, same time, same place, back here on the podcast. We will have part two of this episode. See you then. If you're loving what you're learning in the podcast, you have got to come check out The Clutch. The Clutch is the podcast community for all things Unfuck Your Brain. It's where you can get individual help applying the concepts to your own life. It's where you can learn new coaching tools not shared on the podcast that will blow your mind even more. And it's where you can hang out and connect over all things thought work with other podcast chickens just like you and me. It's my favorite place on earth and it will change your life. I guarantee it. Come join us at www.unfuckyourbrain.com forward slash the clutch. That's unfuckyourbrain.com forward slash the clutch. I can't wait to see you there.